Hello and good afternoon friends, welcome to the CEC Edisit Live Lecture. Dear friends, as you know that we are carrying a series on uh, genetics and so far we have conducted numerous uh, sessions, numerous uh, lectures under the series uh, genetics. Uh, dear friends, uh, in this session today, today uh, we would be specifically going to talk on extra nuclear inheritance and for this we have once again with us within our studios Dr. Charu Dogra Rawat. Dr. Charu Dogra Rawat is an assistant professor in Department of Zoology, Ramjus College University of Delhi and dear friends her immense experience would definitely help us out in understanding the topic extra nuclear inheritance uh, at a very wide scale. So without wasting any time I would like to welcome our guest Dr. Charu Dogra Rawat. Dr. Rawat welcome to the Edisit lecture. Thank you Ketika. Uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, so today as she said the topic of my talk would be extra nuclear inheritance. Inheritance is the passing of traits from one generation to another. And today we'll talk about the mechanisms of this transmission of traits by anything which is extra nuclear. So usually it is by the chromosomes which are lying in the nucleus, but we'll talk about the mechanisms by which the traits can be passed on by this extra nuclear mechanisms. So particularly the learning objectives for this session would be to understand the extra nuclear inheritance arising from the organelle function, the mitochondria and the chloroplast. We'll understand the origin of mitochondria and chloroplast in eukaryotes. We'll understand the organization of mitochondrial and chloroplast DNA. We'll understand the mechanism of organelle heredity in various, by various examples such as in variegation of 4 o'clock plants, occurrence of pokey and petite mutants in neurospora and saccharomyces respectively, and in occurrence of some human disorders. So basically the basic tenant of Mendelian transmission genetics is that the phenotype is transmitted by nuclear genes that are located on the chromosomes of both the parents. But extra nuclear inheritance occurs when the phenotypes result from genetic influence other than the biparental transmission of genes located on the chromosomes contained in the nucleus. So anything which is extra nuclear, which is apart from the mechanism of that Mendelian fashion of transmission of traits. A variety of mechanisms occur for this extra nuclear inheritance, such as the organelle heredity. The DNA contained in mitochondria or the chloroplast determines certain phenotypic characters of the offspring. And this can be recognized on the basis of usually the uniparental transmission of these organelles, usually from the female parent of the egg to the progeny. So we'll look at the organelle heredity in detail. The infectious heredity which results from a symbiotic or parasitic association with microorganisms. In such cases, an inherited phenotype is affected by the presence of a microorganism in the cytoplasm of the host cells. Another mechanism for this extranuclear inheritance is what is termed as the maternal effect, whereby the nuclear gene products are stored in the egg and then transmitted through the ooplasm to the offspring. These gene products are distributed to cells of the developing embryo and influence its phenotype and thus it is also termed as the maternal influence. The common thing between all these mechanisms of extranuclear inheritance is that the transmission of the genetic information to the offspring or the progeny through the cytoplasm rather than through the nucleus. So most often usually we'll see that it is from one of the parent that is called as the uniparental transmission but there can be examples where there is a biparental mode of transmission also. But the essential point is that the transmission of genetic information is via the cytoplasm and not via the chromosomes which are present in the nucleus. So we'll start with the organelle heredity, the inheritance patterns arising from the chloroplast and the mitochondrial function. The analysis is much more complex for traits controlled by the gene and genes encoded by the organelle DNA than for Mendelian characters controlled by the nuclear genes. And why is it so? There are two reasons for that. First, that the function of these organelles is dependent on the gene products from both nuclear and the organelle DNA, making the discovery of the genetic origin of mutations affecting organelle function difficult. 
So organelles do not function autonomously. They are semi-autonomous organelles. So the functioning of these organelles do depend upon the protein products which are coming from the nuclear genes. So this dependency makes it a little difficult for the discovery of the mutations that are occurring or the effect of the mutations that are occurring in the organelle DNA. Another reason is that that large number of these organelles are contributed to each progeny cell following the cell division. There is not one organelle per molecule, one organelle per cell which is present. So there are a number of organelles which are present which are then distributed to the progeny. If only one or a few of the organelles acquire a new mutation or contain an existing one in a cell with a population of mostly normal organelles, the corresponding mutant phenotype may not be revealed since the organelles lacking the mutation perform the wild type function for the cell. So it's a heterogeneous uh, population of organelles which, are, which might be present in the progeny cell, some containing the mutation but some are which are the normal organelles. So if the normal organelles are more in number, the mutant phenotype will not be revealed. Such a variation in the genetic content of the organelles is termed as the heteroplasmy. So because of these two reasons, the analysis is very complex in the case of uh, phenotypic traits which are exhibited by the organelles which are there. But we have to look at the uh, origin of these organelles inside the eukaryotic cells to understand the mechanism by which they function in a better manner. So organelle DNA and the endosymbiotic theory. This endosymbiotic theory was proposed by a former Boston University biologist Lynn Margulis in the 1960s. And she said basically that the DNA, which is ancestors of the eukaryotic cells, were symbiotic consortiums of prokaryotic cells with at least one and possibly more species involved. This basically meant that there was a heterotrophic aerobic, anaerobic prokaryote in whose cytoplasm an aerobic prokaryotic microbe, the proto-mitochondrion, was ingested. So this was an anaerobic host and in this primitive prokaryotic host cell, an aerobic bacteria was ingested resulting in the evolution of an aerobic amoeboid organism. So this is also the primitive of the today's eukaryotic cell but that is how the mitochondria came into being. Similarly, the evolution of plastids or the chloroplasts was also depicted as several ingestions of different photosynthetic prokaryotes occur which evolved which gave a result to the protoplastids that evolved from oxygen consuming prokaryotes homologous to the cyanobacteria to become the heterotrophic protozoans. So basically the injection ingestion of these aerobic bacteria or the photo synthetic bacteria gave rise to the ancestors of the today's eukaryotic cells and these mitochondria and chloroplasts were basically once upon a time free living bacteria that were ingested and then they evolved to become the modern mitochondria and the chloroplast. And that the evidence for this is very, um, the very relevant evidence for this is that they contain their own DNA. The DNA which is very much related to the bacterial DNA which is there. So they contain, they are semi-autonomous organelles and they have their own, they divide different from the nuclear genes although they, during the evolution, they came to depend on the gene products of the nucleus also but by themselves they also encode certain proteins. So let's look at the DNA of the uh, chloroplast as well as the mitochondrial DNA. So if you look at the chloroplast DNA, the size ranges between 100 and 225 kb in length. It's circular and double-stranded and it is free of nuclear proteins such as the nucleosomes, etc. It has different density and base composition than the nuclear DNA. There are many long non-coded nucleotide sequences both between and within the genes are present. The ones within the genes are called as the introns. So many long non-coded nucleotide sequences are found in the chloroplast DNA. The duplications of many DNA sequences are also evident. There is not a single copy of chloroplast DNA which is present. Many copies of chloroplast DNA molecule per organelle can be present. And the genes carried on the DNA encode products which are involved in the photosynthesis and translation. So you can look at the uh, basically the uh, chloroplast DNA and it contains the genes for the ribosomal RNAs, 23S and 63S ribosomal RNAs. 
So basically it is involved, it will be part of the ribosomal ribosomes and therefore it is a part of the translation machinery. Apart from that, it also encodes for the enzymes which are required for the photosynthesis which is like photosystem 1 and photosystem 2 gene products and then ATP synthetase and NADH dehydrogenase etc. for um, uh, other functions which are there. So the gene products basically are involved in the photosynthesis and the translation. Now if you look at the mitochondrial DNA, it is not as big as the chloroplast DNA but it is circular and double stranded and again it is free of the chromosomal proteins. The size can vary greatly among organisms. For example, in humans it is 16.6 kb, in drosophila it is 18.4 kb whereas in Arabidopsis thaliana it can be 367 kb's mitochondrial DNA is there. The vertebrates usually have 5 to 10 such DNA molecules per organelle while plants usually have 20 to 40 copies per organelle. Generally, the introns are absent from mitochondrial genes and the gene repetitions are also seldom present. Then there are no intergenic spacers which are also there. Now if you look at these things, there are two different strands, you know, the, even these two strands of the mitochondrial DNA differ in their density. The one is called as the H strand or the heavy strand and the other is called as the L strand or the light strand. So the heavy strand has most of the genes which are present and the most of the mitochondrial genes which are encoded by the H strand are basically involved in the cellular respiration or for the translation process which are there. So the mitochondrial encoded gene products are part of the protein synthesizing apparatus. So you can see that there are a number of tRNAs which are encoded on the mitochondrial genome and the molecular components for the cellular respiration such as the cytochrome C oxidase or ATP synthase and cytochrome C oxidase 3 etc. So the cellular respiration uh, genes are also encoded by the mitochondrial DNA which is there. So the chloroplast as well as the mitochondrial DNA existed in the, in the uh, recent eukaryotic cells by probably the endosymbiotic theory and you also know that the DNA they encode that the genes encoded on their DNA are mostly involved in the translation or related to their own function such as the photosynthesis or the respiration which is there. So now let us look at the uh, inheritance mechanism of these uh, organelles and how they affect the phenotype of a particular individual. So the first example um, I explain is regarding the chloroplast inheritance in the variegation of the 4 o'clock plants. So there is a variant of 4 o'clock plant which is Mirabilis chalapa in which some branches had white leaves, some had green, however some had patches of both green and white leaves. So such variant could be observed. And this was explained by Carl Correns in 1908. The completely white leaves and the white areas in variegated leaves lacked the chlorophyll which is otherwise provides the green color. So the plants have chlorophyll which is contained in the chloroplasts and that provides the green color. However, the white parts of the Mirabilis jalapa or the variegated, you know, the white portion in the variegated leaves was because there was no chlorophyll present or there was a mutation in the chloroplast and therefore the phenotype was exhibited. The inheritance in all possible combination of crosses is strictly determined by the phenotype of the ovule source. So when they crossed different varieties that they found that whatever the uh, phenotype of the plant from where the ovule was taken was given in the phenotype of the progeny. So you can see if the pollen was coming from a plant which had a white branch but if the ovule was coming from a white plant branch it gave a white phenotype. If the ovule was coming from a green branch it gave a green phenotype in the offspring. If the ovule was coming from a variegated branch it gave a white, green or variegated branch of uh, in the progeny. So basically the source of pollen, the phenotype of the source of pollen did not matter. But the phenotype of the from where the ovule was coming mattered and it was exhibited by the uh, pheno in the phenotype of the progeny which was there. So inheritance in all the possible combination of crosses was strictly determined by the phenotype of the ovule source. So this reflected that inheritance was transmitted through the cytoplasm of the maternal parent. 
because the pollen which contributes little or no cytoplasm to the zygote had no apparent influence on the progeny phenotypes. So we talked about sex determination and anisogramy is very prevalent. So the egg has a large cytoplasm, it is large in size whereas the sperm is usually a very smaller in size. So when the fertilization takes place then the larger egg is the one which contributes the most of the cytoplasm to the progeny and sperm only contributes the nucleus or the nuclear genes. So because the cytoplasm is coming from the maternal parent then therefore it is uh, evident that the inheritance of such as variegation in 4 o'clock plants is transmitted through the cytoplasm of the maternal parent because whatever was the phenotype of the maternal parent was the phenotype of the progeny irrespective of the phenotype of the male um, uh, uh, parent which was there. Another example we can see is in the chloroplast mutations in case of Chlamydomonas. So it was described by Ruth Sager in 1954. Chlamydomonas is a unicellular green alga and particularly he worked on Chlamydomonas reinhardti. The haploid eukaryotic organism has a single large chloroplast containing about 75 copies of circular double-stranded DNA molecule. So following the fertilization, the single chloroplasts of the two mating types fuse to form one chloroplast which is there. There are two mating types that can be identified and referred to as MT plus and MT minus and they appear to make equal cytoplasmic contributions to the zygote. The meiosis of the zygote results in the production of haploid cells in which the genetic information in the chloroplast is derived only from the MT plus parent. However, the genetic information originally present within the MT minus chloroplast degenerates. Now, how did he find out this? He basically underwent uh, reciprocal crosses and he, uh, he basically uh, looked at the resistance towards certain antibiotics such as streptomycin resistance phenotype he observed was transmitted only through the MT plus parent. So these are the reciprocal crosses which are performed. So you can see that there is a resistant strain and MT plus streptomycin resistant strain when crossed with streptomycin sensitive MT minus strain they give uh, they give 50 percent of the genotypic progeny for MT plus which is there but streptomycin was all resistant. When the reciprocal cross was done and an MT plus streptomycin sensitive strain was taken and MT minus were the resistant strain then all the progeny was streptomycin res uh, sensitive. So streptomycin or the basically antibiotic resistant phenotype is given by the MT plus parent. If it is resistant the, uh, the progeny will be resistant if it is sensitive the progeny will be sensitive. The mating type however is basically transmitted in a completely Mendelian fashion because you can see that there were half the population of MT plus and half the population of MT minus which was there for both the for the uh, for the two reciprocal crosses. So mating type behavior was transmitted in a typical Mendelian fashion but antibiotic sensitive phenotype was transmitted in a extra nuclear inheritance or basically cytoplasmic inheritance which was there. So the reciprocal crosses between sensitive and resistant strains yield different results depending upon the genotype of the MT plus parent which is expressed in all the offsprings. One half of the offspring are MT plus and one of half, half of them are MT minus indicating that mating type is controlled by a nuclear gene that segregates in a Mendelian fashion. So the antibiotic resist antibiotic susceptibility is transmitted by the cytoplasm and not by the nuclear genes. Another example is the chloroplast inheritance in case of Pessiflora which was described by A.K. Hansen 2007. So this is a passion flower which is basically there. The multiple modes of inheritance are found in Passiflora. There is a paternal, maternal as well as a biparental uh, transmission, mode of transmission. Uh, in the previous examples what we have seen there is a uniparental trans uh, transfer which is there. So from the egg it is going to the progeny. So that is called as the maternal inheritance. If 
it is coming from the father and it is staying in the progeny, then it is said to be the paternal inheritance. But usually the organelles can be contributed by both the parents and they, if, if they exhibit a phenotype, then it is said to be a biparental inheritance which is there. And in chloroplast inheritance, in passive flora, it basically uh, have multiple modes of inheritance patterns which are there. The interspecific crosses had primarily paternal inheritance. So, if a Passiflora osteri is crossed with Passiflora retipitala, then it showed strict pater paternal inheritance in all of the 17 progeny. Similarly, if uh, Passiflora osteri and Passiflora menispermifolia is crossed, then it also demonstrated strictly paternal inheritance which is there. The intraspecific crosses had primarily maternal inheritance. So, if Passiflora costaricensis is crossed with Passiflora costaricensis, then 12 of the 15 showed maternal inheritance. However, the remaining 3 progeny were biparental, uh, uh, exhibiting biparental mode of transmission which was there. So, mating outside the species which is basically the interspecific crosses is somehow detected at the germ cell level and a choice is made to switch to the paternal chloroplast inheritance which is there. So, both the chloroplasts are basically transmitted to the progeny but specifically the paternal chloroplasts are degenerated and therefore it exhibited a maternal inheritance as far as the intraspecific crosses is concerned. So, when interspecific crosses are taken place then somehow at the germ cell level this is detected and paternal uh, chloroplast is remained and the maternal one is degenerated. However, in some of the progeny, both the chloroplasts could be found exhibiting the biparental mode of transmittance which is there. The next example we see is the mitochondrial mutations in case of bread mold neurospora which was explained by Mary B. Mitchell and Herschel K. Mitchell in 1952. So, this is a micrograph illustrating the growth of the bread mold, common bread mold which is called as the Neurospora cressa and certain mutants which are called as the pokey mutants or MI1 also referred to as maternal inheritance mutants were identified. They grow slowly and it was found that they had a defect in the mitochondrial genes particularly the uh, ones producing the cytochrome proteins. The results of the genetic crosses between the wild type and the pokey strains suggest that the trait is maternally inherited. So basically, if there is a female which is coming from a norm, uh, which is coming from a uh, normal, uh, there is a pokey female and there is a normal male which is there, and then there is a uh, reproduction which is occurring, then the all the pokey spores will come up. However, if there is a normal female and there is a pokey male, the spores which will be produced after the meiosis of the diploid is will be all normal spores. So, if there is a pokey female, there is a pokey spores which are formed and giving rise to the pokey hyphae. If there is a no, or in pokey uh, hyphae which are there, if there is a normal female, then basically all the normal spores will be there irrespective of the nuclear condition or irrespective of the uh, state of the male which is there. So, the mycelia originating from the conidia of the heterocarion first develop normally and then start showing the pokey phenotype. So, they ultimately showed the pokey phenotype where because there was a defect in the mutation, there was a defect in the mitochondrial gene that produced the cytochrome proteins and therefore, the cellular respiration was not efficient and therefore, the colonies or the hyphae were basically tend to be uh, said to be as the pokey mutants and they were growing very slowly because of the uh, absence or, or the diminishing of the cellular respiration which is there. Another example of mitochondrial mutations can be seen in the yeast which is the Saccharomyces cerevisiae identified by Boris Efrusi in 1956. There are certain mutants which are identified called as the petite mutants. The colonies are small because of a block in the aerobic respiratory chain pathway that generates ATP. So, there is basically the petite yeasts are unable to grow on non-fermentable carbon sources such as glycerol or ethanol 
and form very small anaerobic sized colonies when grown in the presence of fermentable carbon sources, sources such as glucose. So there is a mutation in mitochondrial gene which is there, which is again, you know, slowing down the process of cellular respiration. And therefore the colonies which are formed are very small as compared to the normal colonies which occur. So these are termed as the petite mutants. And when the petite phenotype is uh, examined, then it results from the mutations in the mitochondrial genome, the loss of the mitochondria or mutations in the host cell genome. So basically three different kind of mutants can occur. One petites or petites are called as the segregational petites. They are the result of the nuclear mutation in genes whose products are transported to and function in mitochondria. They exhibit a Mendelian inheritance. So one of the petites is basically if there is a haploid petite and there is a haploid normal and if you cross them then there will be a zygote. After meiosis the exospores will be there will be half petites and there will be half normal. So basically it shows that there is a Mendelian pattern of inheritance in such kind of petites and therefore it might be governed by a nuclear gene which is present. Two other kinds of petites were then identified or distinguished. One was called as the neutral petites and in neutral petites when they are crossed to the wild type, they yield meiotic products called escospores that give rise to the wild type or the normal colonies. So if you cross the petite with the normal one, then all progeny what you get is the normal. The same pattern continues if progeny of such crosses are back crossed to the neutral petites. The majority of neutrals lack mitochondrial DNA completely or have lost a substantial portion of it. So for their offspring to be normal, the neutrals must also be inheriting mitochondria capable of aerobic respiration from the normal parent following the reproduction. So when a petite and a normal is crossed, then the mitochondria from both the individuals will come into the diploid zygote. This might have a complete loss of mitochondria. But this has wild type mitochondria in which there is no mutation which is there. So probably this mitochondria will function for the aerobic respiration and therefore you will all have the normal uh, colonies which will grow. The functional mitochondria from the normal parent are replicated in the offspring and support the aerobic respiration. However, there were certain petites which were called as the suppressive petites because when they were crossed to the normal uh, uh, colonies, uh, they were crossed with the normal individual. The crosses between the mutant and the wild type give rise to diploid zygotes which after meiosis yield petite phenotypes. Now assuming that the, uh, the offspring have received mitochondria from both the parents, the petite cells behave as what is called as a dominant negative mutation which somehow suppresses the function of the wild type mitochondria. So despite of the fact that the mitochondria from both the individuals will be passed on to the diploid zygote, still all were petite because this mutation was somehow dominant to the mitochondrial, the normal mitochondrial or the wild type mitochondrial phenotype and it did not let the normal mitochondria to function and there was a lack of aerobic respiration and therefore all the colonies were petite. The mutant or the deleted DNA in the mitochondria replicates more rapidly, that could be one of the reason or the recombination occurred between the mutant and the wild type mitochondrial DNA introducing errors into or disrupting the normal mitochondrial DNA which is there. So when in Saccharomyces yeast there are three different kind of colonies, petite colonies which are identified by crossing them with the normal uh, normal cells which are there. So one is called as the segregational petites which are basically the effect of the phenotypic effect is of the nuclear gene because half of both the progeny both the types are obtained. Then there is neutral petites which are basically that the wild type phenotype will overcome the petite phenotype and there is a suppressive petite where the uh, mutant phenotype is overcoming the wild type phenotype which is there. But all this is related to the mitochondrial inheritance pattern and this is obtained because of the differential inheritance of the mitochondria which is there or there is a mutation in a mitochondria which is then inherited to the offspring which is there. Another example is the cytoplasmic male sterility in plants. This is a condition in which a plant does not produce functional pollen but the female reproductive organs are fertile and normal. 
This is very important in agriculture and extensively used to produce hybrid seeds such as the corn seeds. This circumvents the need for manual detasseling of the plants to be used as females to produce hybrids. So self-fertilization is inhibited by the detasseling of the pollen. So this basically circumvents the need for this because the, uh, the plant is already male sterile. The genetic transmitted male sterility transmitted through the egg cytoplasm from generation to generation. So again it is a cytoplasmic inheritance which is there. So repeated back crossing of a male sterile variety using pollen from a male fertile variety does not restore male fertility and that basically tells us this fact that you know if you, if you take a, a sterile plant which is a male uh, sterile plant and then you use the pollen from a male fertile plant to, uh, uh, to, uh, to bring out the progeny and you can see that there, there is a cytoplasm which is maternally inherited. The nuclear genes are a mixture of maternal and paternal alleles and half from the male fertile parent are there. So the genes are half of the genes are male fertile parent but still the progeny which is produced is a male sterile progeny. Similarly in the next cross if you use a male fertile to cross this progeny still it will be a male sterile plant. So as the genome is increasing you know the male fertile genome is increasing and the male sterile genome is diluting but still it is a male sterile plant which is obtained. So the nuclear gene does not have an effect but the cytoplasmic inheritance of this male sterility is playing a role and thus all the progeny no matter how many back crosses are done the male sterile variety is produced. Some male fertile pollens are also produced in this case. A small amount of functional pollen are also produced by the male sterile variety. And if you reciprocal cross this that you, if you take a male fertile female and cross it with a male sterile male, you will get a fully male fertile which is there. So the male sterility is maternity, maternally inherited. So you have a male fertile female and therefore the progeny is male fertile irrespective of the fact that it is crossed with a male sterile male which is there. So in all these cases there was male sterile female variety which we were using and the male sterile male was basically used in here. So the reciprocal cross if you use a male fertile female it will produce a fully male fertile progeny which is there. The chloroplast, uh, this uh, uh, cytoplasmic male sterility in maize results from the rearrangements in the mitochondrial DNA and certain nuclear genes can act as fertility restorers and they can suppress the male sterilizing effect of the cytoplasm which is there. So if you use a line A, so some kind of a you know restorer gene can play an effect on it. So for example, if this is a male sterile individual which is there and this is a fertile individual which, which is there, but both of them have a fertility restorers which is homozygous for the maintainer gene. For example, we call it as R. So all the progeny will be male sterile because this is male sterile cytoplasm which is coming. But if it is crossed with an individual which can be fertile or sterile but has a dominant R gene or the maintenance gene, then the hybrid produced will be fertile irrespective of the fact that it has the sterile cytoplasm which is coming from here because the or, or the fertile cytoplasm which is it but it will be fertile because of this dominant R gene the heterozygous for the restorer gene which is there. The different types of CMS can be classified on the basis of their responses to these kind of reporter genes which is there. A lot of human disorders are also found because of the mitochondrial mutations. The human mitochondrial DNA as we discussed contain approximately 16569 base pairs. It encodes 2 ribosomal RNAs, 22 transfer RNAs and 13 polypeptides essential to the oxidative respiratory functions of the organelle. The mitochondrial DNA is particularly vulnerable to mutations. You know a lot of human as we are discussing about the mitochondrial mutations leading to the human disorders. We must talk about the vulnerability of the mitochondrial DNA for mutations and they, it is very high and this is basically for two possible reasons. One is that the mitochondrial DNA does not have the structural protection from mutations provided by the histone proteins present in the nuclear DNA. So we saw that the mitochondrial DNA does not have any, is not associated with any chromosomal like proteins which are there. 
So it is structurally more vulnerable towards the mutations. And secondly, the mitochondria concentrate highly mutagenic reactive oxygen species or ROS generated by the cell respiration. In such a confined space, ROS are very toxic to the contents of the organelle and are known to damage proteins, lipids and mitochondrial DNA. Ultimately, this increases the frequency of point, point mutations and deletions in the mitochondria. So, mitochondrial DNA is vulnerable to mutations and because of this, a lot of human disorders can arise. In order for a human disorder to be attributable to genetically altered mitochondria, several criteria must be met. The first thing is that inheritance must exhibit a maternal rather than a Mendelian pattern. So, if a mitochondrial DNA mutation needs to exhibit a phenotype, then it has to be an inherited in a cytoplasmic maternal uh, inheritance rather than a Mendelian pattern. The disorder must reflect a deficiency in the bioenergetic function of the organelle that it, ha it has to be associated with the organelle function. Then there must be a mutation in one or more of the mitochondrial genes. So, there are number of disorders like my myoclonic epilepsy and rag bread fiber disease which is termed as MRF. Only the offspring of affected mothers inherited this order. The offspring of affected fathers are normal. The features include such as ataxia, the lack of muscular coordination, deafness, dementia and epileptic seizures. The presence of ragged red skeletal muscle fibers by which the name comes, the name of the disorder comes in and they exhibit blotchy red patches resulting from the proliferation of aberrant mitochondria. The results from a mutation in one of the 22 mitochondrial genes encoding a transfer RNA gives rise to this particular disorder. Specifically, the gene encoding for the tRNA for the lysine contains an A to G transition within its sequence. The cells of the affected individuals exhibit heteroplasmy containing a mixture of normal and abnormal mitochondria. Were it not for heteroplasmy, the mutation would have likely to be lethal because it is affecting a particular gene and affecting the translation process exhibited by the mitochondrial DNA and therefore the mutation would have been lethal otherwise because it is heteroplasmy that there are certain normal mitochondria also present such a kind of manifestation of the diseases there. Another disorder is a Leher's hereditary optic neuropathy or called as LHON characterized by sudden bilateral blindness and it affects the optic nerve. The average age of vision loss is 27. The four mutations have been identified, all of which disrupt normal oxidative phosphorylation, which is the final pathway of respiration in cells. More than 50% of the cases are due to a mutation at a specific position in the mitochondrial gene encoding a subunit of the NADH dehydrogenase. Many instances of LHON, there is usually no family history and a significant number of cases are sporadic the resulting from newly arisen mutations which are there. Another syndrome which is because of the mitochondrial mutation is termed as the Keen-Sayre syndrome. This, uh, the, the features basically are the loss of vision, the hearing lo loss and there are heart problems which are there. The genetic basis of KSS again involves the deletions at various positions within the mitochondrial DNA. The mitochondria is also associated with the aging process. The mitochondrial dysfunction seems to be implicated in most all major disease conditions including the type 2 diabetes, arthrosclerosis, neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson, Alzheimer and Huntington disease, schizophrenia and bipolar disorders and a variety of cancers such as skin, colorectal, liver, breast, pancreatic, lung, prostate and bladder cancers. So, mitochondrial dysfunction seems to be associated with all the major disorders and in fact as I said a link between the progressive decline of mitochondrial function and the aging process is also exhibited because of the ROS, the reactive oxygen species generated by the, uh, by the mitochondria. The mitochondrial mutations are enhanced and these species are basically leading to the dysfunction of the organelle and therefore the aging process which is there. So, a number of mitochondrial disorders, mitochondrial dysfunction disorders are found in the human beings also. So, just to summarize what we talked about in this session is the patterns of inheritance sometimes vary from those expected from the biparental transmission of nuclear genes. Often the phenotypes appear to result from genetic information transmitted through the cytoplasm of the egg. 
Organelle heredity is based on the genotypes of the chloroplast and the mitochondrial DNA as these organelles are transmitted to the offspring. Both the chloroplast and the mitochondria first appeared in primitive eukaryotic cells some 2 billion years ago originating as inv in invading protobacteria which then co-evolved with the host cell according to the endosymbiotic theory. And then we talked about the chloroplast mutations that affect the photosynthetic capability of plants whereas mitochondrial mutations affect cells highly dependent on energy generated through cellular respiration. The resulting mutants display phenotype related to the loss of function of these organelles and we also saw that the mutations in human mitochondrial DNA are the underlying causes of a range of heritable genetic disorders in humans. Talking about the extra nuclear inheritance, we'll talk about the other mechanisms other than the organelle heredity, we'll talk about the infectious heredity and the uh, maternal effect in this particular session. The learning specific learning objectives would be to understand the extra nuclear inheritance as shown in the infectious heredity, we'll understand the inheritance of the killer trait in paramecium the infective particles in drosophila leading to the carbon dioxide sensitivity and the sex ratio. We will understand the extra nuclear inheritance due to maternal effect in epistemia, pigmentation, snail shell coiling patterns and embryonic development in drosophila. So, we will talk about the infectious heredity first. The infectious heredity results from a symbiotic or parasitic association with the microorganism. An inherited phenotype is affected by the presence of the microorganism in the cytoplasm of the host cells. So, we will start with the example of the inheritance of the killer trait in paramecium as described by the Sonneborn in 1938. So, some paramecia express what is called as the killer trait. The killer paramecia release toxic particles called as paramecin into the environment and these particles kill the sensitive paramecium cells after ingestion. So, you can see that the killer paramecium has certain particles which are present. The sensitive and killer paramecia differ only in the presence of these particles and these particles are basically the endosymbiotic CD vector which is referred to as the kappa particles. Every CD vector population with its host cell represents two morphological different forms the reproductive non-brites while which has lost the capability to divide after the production of an R body are termed as the brites. So, they contain this R body and it is constituted of a coiled proteinaceous ribbon which can unroll in a telescopic fashion. So, these kappa particles have lost the reproductive but this is basically for the injection of the toxic material to the sensitive strain and the non-brites are the one which has which is carrying out the reproductive process which is there. So, to understand this we need to understand about the mechanism of reproduction in paramecium. So, one of the mechanism is termed as the conjugation when the two uh, paramecia come together the conjugation with one macronucleus and two micronuclei in each. So, uh, one paramecia has a macronucleus and two micronuclei. So, both the things come together both the uh, uh, cells come together there is a meiosis of micronuclei that occur. So, then the cell would have one macronucleus and there are eight micronuclei in each which are there. Then the disintegration of 7 micronuclei and macronucleus in each is there. So, there will be only one micronuclei which will be present. It will be followed by the mitotic division 
The mitotic division will lead to the now presence of two haploid micronuclei in each. These two micronuclei then the nuclear exchange occurs. So the nuclear exchange between the two paramecia occurs and the two exchanged micronuclei when then fuse together to form one diploid micronucleus in each of the organism. It will be again followed by two mitotic divisions and then there will be four diploid micronuclei in each. The two micronuclei when then fuse to form the one macronucleus giving rise to the typical paramecium uh, uh, configuration having one macronucleus and two micronuclei in each. So many replications of macronucleus of the DNA, the two organisms will separate and will give rise to the X conjugates in which there will be one macronucleus and two micro hybrid micronuclei or basically recombined micronuclei will be there. So this is the mechanism of reproduction which is termed as conjugation. Sporadically the paramecia can also uh, reproduce by a process which is called as autogamy. So in autogamy the meiosis of the micronuclei occur in the single uh, uh, paramecia and there will be a formation of 8 micronuclei which will be there. The 7 micronuclei will disintegrate and so will the macronucleus which will be followed by the mitotic division and therefore 2 haploid micronuclei will be there. The two haploid micronuclei will fuse together to give rise to a one diploid micronucleus will, will, which will undergo two mitotic divisions to yield four diploid micronuclei. The fusion of the two micronuclei will give the configuration of a paramecium containing one macronucleus and two micronuclei. The many replications of the macronucleus DNA will give rise to the basically one macronucleus and the two micronuclei which are there which is present in this case. So this is termed as the autogamy which is there. So now look at the pattern of the kappa particle inheritance. If a cross is between made between a killer strain and a sensitive strain then there are two possibilities. One possibility is when the nuclear transfer is occurring then there is no cytoplasmic exchange that occurs. So the kappa particles or the CD vector is present in the cytoplasm of the killer strain. So when the two strains come together and the nuclear exchange occurs then there is no cytoplasmic exchange which is there and therefore in the F1 progeny there will be equal number of the killer and the sensitive strains. The autogamy of the killer strain will then produce a killer strain and a sensitive strain and the sensitive will produce both the sensitive strains which are there. So in this manner basically there is three sensitive strains and one killer strain that is obtained. So without cytoplasmic mixing the expected ratio of 1 is to 1 of killer to sensitive X conjugates is observed. However, when there is a cytoplasmic exchange that occurs, so at the process of nuclear exchange then there is some cytoplasm which leaks and which is basically transferred from uh, into the each other cell and the, all the progeny will therefore will be the killer strain because there is a cytoplasmic transfer from the killer strain to the sensitive strain transferring the CD bacterium microorganism which is there and therefore the progeny will all be killer. So with the cytoplasmic mixing both X conjugates are killer cells because each cell has now kappa particles derived from the cytoplasm of the killer parent. However, the autogamy of the killer strain results in equal number of killer and KK cells but the KK cells cannot, the small KK cells or the sensitive cells cannot maintain the kappa particle and so become sensitive. So they can maintain, the killer strain can maintain the kappa particle because they have a maintenance gene. So they can maintain in their cytoplasm the, uh, the CD vector which is there. So the autogamy of the killer strain will lead to killer strain as well as the sensitive strain which is there. So the same number of, so in this case there will be two sensitive strains. So the killer strain will also produce 1 is to 1 ratio of the killer and the sensitive and the killer will also produce 1 is to 1 ratio of the killer and the sensitive because in the sensitive cytoplasm the CD vector is not maintained. So you can see if there is a cytoplasmic inheritance which is there then a killer strain will propagate however the sensitive strains will be distinct, uh, diminished in the number. So another uh, example of this infective particles which are transmitted is in present in case of the Drosophila. So the carbon dioxide sensitivity was shown by L. Heritier and Tisser in 1958. 
the flies that would normally recover from carbon dioxide anesthetization instead become permanently paralyzed and are killed by carbon dioxide. So, they identified these mutants in which the carbon dioxide anesthetization they could not recover, but they were permanently paralyzed and killed. The sensitive mothers passed this trait to all the offspring. So, primarily it was maternal, predominantly it was maternal inheritance, although paternal inheritance could also be there. But usually the sensitive mothers passed this trait to all the offspring. The extract of the sensitive flies induced the trait when injected into the resistant fly. So, it was a basically a cytoplasmic inheritance which was there and later it was found that this sensitivity was due to the presence of a virus which is called as sigma and the specific genes support the presence of sigma in drosophila like the maintenance of kappa particles in the paramecium or the uh, maintenance of the CD vector uh, in the case of paramecium was there. So, there were genes, nuclear genes which were uh, basically governing the presence of these bacteria inside the host organisms and they exhibit a particular kind of a phenotype. For example, the killer trait in case of paramecium and carbon dioxide sensitivity in case of drosophila. Another example in the case of drosophila is exhibited by maternal sex ratio. In the drosophila bifasciata, they produce predominantly female offspring if reared at 21 degrees Celsius or lower. The condition is designated as sex ratio and it is transmitted to daughters but not to the low number of male progeny produced. So, predominantly only the female offspring which is produced and the male progeny is inhibiting from producing and this is transmitted through the daughters. It is also seen in Drosophila villistoni that the injection of ooplasm from the sex ratio females into the abdomen of the normal females induced this condition. So, basically it was a cytoplasmic inheritance which was occurring. The condition was later found out to be uh, occurring due to the presence of a spiroplasma. Spiroplasmas are maternally inherited, transovarially transmitted and lethal to the male embryo. So, the presence of spiroplasmas in, this, in the cytoplasm of the sex ratio females will make sure that the male progeny is uh, killed or it is lethal to the male embryos giving this kind of a maternal sex ratio which was there. So, the infective particles was the one which was basically giving rise to particular phenotypes in case of drosophila. The third mechanism of extranuclear inheritance can be seen in, uh, in what is termed as the maternal effect. So, in maternal effect an offspring's phenotype for a particular trait is under the control of nuclear gene products present in the egg. So, the nucleus of the egg transcribe and produce certain gene products which are accumulated in the egg. So, after fertilization these gene products influence the phenotype of the offspring which is there. So, we will see this by taking the examples such as for the Ephistia pigmentation. The wild type larva of the Mediterranean meal pot called as the Ephistia quenella has a pigmented skin and brown eyes as a result of the presence of a dominated, dominant gene termed as A. The pigment is derived from a precursor molecule called as kinurinin, which in turn is a derivative of the amino acid tryptophan. However, a mutation small a is also uh, when present interrupts the synthesis of this kinurin and when homozygous may result in red eyes and little pigmentation in the larva. So, this is a highly pigmented with the brown eyes wild type larva which is either capital A capital A or a capital A small a containing the dominant gene. However, the mutated uh, uh, larva could also be found can be identified in which there is a lighter pigmentation which is there and moreover the eye is red in color. So, that will have a homozygous or a small a small a condition which is there. Now, if you look at this inheritance pattern by the reciprocal crosses, then you will see that if a brown colored or a wild type male is crossed with a homozygous recessive mutated red eyed female, then the larva produced are basically 1 is to 1 ratio of brown or it can be red. So, AA male and female could be there which are basically brown in color or small a male and female which will be basically red in color which will be there. But if 
the female is brown in color and the male is red in color then you will see that all the larvae which is produced is irrespective of whether it is a male or a female whether it is having a dominant A gene or not it will be brown in color. So even the homozygous recessive will be brown in color. So the ephystia pigmentation is depicted by has a maternal effect which is there. So what happens is when this female has some accumulated product of the gene of capital A which is there and therefore initially this will become brown. So when the male is the heterozygous parent, a 1 is to 1 brown to red eyed ratio is observed in a larvae as predicted by the Mendelian segregation. When the female is however heterozygous for the A gene, all larvae are pigmented and have brown eyes in spite of half of them being the small a a. As these larvae develop into adults, one half of them gradually develop red eyes re-establishing the 1 is to 1 ratio. So, in the larval condition they are brown in color but what happens as they grow into the adult, the maternal gene product which is coming from the mother dilutes out because now the, uh, the gene product will be produced for the red eye color and therefore it will be red in color. The AA oocyte synthesize kinurine or an enzyme necessary for its synthesis and accumulate it in this oblasm prior to the completion of meiosis. Even in AA progeny, if even uh, in this recessive homozygous progeny, if the mothers were capital A small a, this pigment is distributed in the cytoplasm of the cells of the developing larvae, thus they develop this pigmentation and the brown eyes. In these progeny, however, the pigment is eventually diluted among many cells and depleted resulting in the conversion of the red eyes as adults. So that is how basically the uh, it is shown that the gene product of the maternal genes is affecting the phenotype of the progeny which is there. Another example we can look at is in the case of limnia where the shell coiling is there. The some strains of the slain, uh, snail limnia pregera have left handed or sinistrally coiled shells while the others have right handed or dextrally coiled cells. The genotype is mentioned as small d small d and the genotype for the dextrally right handed coiled shells can be a capital D capital D or a capital D small d. So basically this capital D gene produce a gene product which is responsible for the right handed or dextrally coiled shells. If this active gene product is absent then it will be a left handed or sinistrally coiled shells which will be there. These snails are hermaphroditic and may undergo either cross or self fertilization providing a variety of types of matings which is there. So now you can see that if in the generation 1 there is a dextral male which is there. So if you take a dextral egg and D sperm. So it is a female where the capital D is present and small d sperm is coming then all the progeny in the generation 2 will be dextral. However, in the next generation again it will if it is self fertilizing then all will be dextral but in the next generation it will give a 3 is to 1 ratio of dextral to sinistral. If however it is a reciprocal call, cr uh, cross there is a capital D sperm which is coming but the egg is a small d then all the progeny will be sinistral because the mother is small d. So irrespective of the capital D gene product which is present the prophenotype will be sinistral and the uh, progeny will all be dextral in the next case because now this capital D gene product will be accumulated and they will all be dextral but in the next generation again they will be dextral or sinistral which is there. So the coiling pattern of the progeny snail is determined by the genotype of the parent producing the egg regardless of the phenotype of that parent. So this is these are the examples for the maternal effect which are there and these are the examples talking about the extra nuclear inheritance which are there.
with this note thank you ma'am thank you so very much for uh, giving us a very very productive uh, session dear friends uh, we would be meeting again very soon and would be discussing on more aspects under the series uh, genetics and uh, if you want to access this lecture then very soon we are going to upload it for you on youtube so that you can uh, view the lecture the number of times you wanted and then afterwards uh, you can give your feedback you can ask question uh, through our mail id that is uh, info.cc at the rate nic.in we would love to solve your queries the next time when Dr. Charu Dugra Rawat visits our studio. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so very much.